Number one, the day is Thursday, October 8th, 2020. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to attend. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions as usual. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just so my ADD doesn't kick in, keep them relative to the slides. And when we get to the live charts, you can ask about anything you want. And also, when we get to the live charts, feel free to start asking about your stock picks. If you do it now, it might get buried or deleted in the Q&A. So that's for your benefit. Also, if you don't mind, I think everybody here already knows that. Just type in one symbol at a time. That way, I'll know what I've covered and what I have. And we'll make sure we get to all of the picks. So what are we going to focus on? Well, two weeks ago, I think we talked about trading problems. And last week, I took a step back and talked about how to solve them before they occur. So I want to continue on with that. And the theme is sort of like it's going to be that most mistakes are rookie mistakes. I was looking through some notes, and every morning I wake up, and I first thing I do after some coffee, of course, is I write three handwritten pages. And that comes from... Julia Cameron, the artist's way. And I did it many, many years before I ever heard of Julia Cameron, but I have to give her credit for getting me back into it. I don't know if the book's worth reading or not, but I read the first uh, few pages that it said, write three pages every day, and I haven't gotten around to finishing the book. And I also have her second book here, which David Keller recommended, and I can't reach it because it's behind the uh, behind the curtain. But I think it's The Artist's Way for Business or something like that. So it's it's on my reading list. I have a bit of a sickness when it comes to, <laughs> I buy far more books than I ever get around to reading, but one day I will read them on. Every night I'll come in here late at night and grab one and start reading it. Anyway, long story endless, I was looking at some of my own notes and one of the notes that I made was most mistakes or rookie mistakes, and that's true. And I'm gonna flesh that out tonight. And that's even by famous, world famous hedge fund managers. And, and you'll see a little bit more of that in just one second. And then I wanna do a brief, follow up on market timing. I also want to talk about a couple of the questions or problems that were submitted on trading too. And I did a show on Tuesday, published Wednesday on market timing using a TFM 10% system. I want to just kind of briefly touch upon that and then touch upon a question that was asked on the YouTube channel. By the way, if you have any questions, you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment below, please. And if you like it, like the video. If you don't like it, Go half, no fun, somewhere else. That was a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as often summing up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's talk about solving your trading problems before they occur. Now, as I said last week, if you understand a little bit about trading psychology and some money management and about the methodology, they're all intertwined. And when I put together this learning management system for the gold members, I was told or was suggested to divide things into three categories. I'm like, that's easy. Mindset, money management, methodology. What's the next thing? And then I realized, wait a minute. Sometimes the money management has a bit of a psychological aspect to it, as I often discuss. Sometimes the psychology can be fixed or improved upon with a little money management. And if you can get better at the methodology, pick up better stocks, then you're gonna have a better mindset. So some of these things are kind of all mixed together and that's where I came up with the holistic trader. But I'd be willing to bet that if you went through all of these courses on the bottom and then wait until the premium courses were unlocked up top to give you the next level of education. But if you went through all the courses on the bottom, I would say probably 90 to 95% of all your trading problems will be solved and maybe even more because most of the trading problems, again, are very simple rookie type of mistakes. Now, we haven't done many this year. I think we've only done one so far. But if you go through the Q&A archives, a lot of the problems were presented and covered there. And I go into those in a lot more detail. So a lot of the things that we might touch upon tonight have been covered there in more details. Now, as I said earlier, Virtually all trading mistakes are rookie mistakes. And as I alluded to a few minutes ago, that's even by people who really should know better. Now, I would never be shot in Friday because I get my ass handed to me quite often. I'm going to show you F up here in just one second. 
make a lot more money if I act like I didn't make mistakes and do dumb stuff, right? I didn't have all the answers, but I'm working on it. But again, that because of that, I would never be shot on Friday. But in my third book, I wrote that you can make better decisions than billionaires. And it was kind of interesting is since the book came out, a lot of billionaires have done some really, really stupid things. But in the book, I was talking about T. Boone Pickens, who lost a billion dollars or $2 billion. I forget how much, but he was betting that oil would go down. And what did oil do? Well, oil imploded and lost most of its value. And he lost billions of dollars in the deal. And I've talked about this extensively, did articles on it. And again, I'm not being shot in Friday. It just makes for such a wonderful example. The Bill Ackman debacle. And what's interesting, if you look back, he lost a billion dollars in this one stock alone. And he actually was buying with the trend. And I don't know how many shares he had back here, but he would have made millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars with a little bit of money management, okay? And then stopped out and could have gone on for his next victim. But instead, he kept buying and he rode these shares down to zero, or not zero, but he rode them down enough to where he was forced out at a billion dollar loss. Now. Mr. Ackman, my apologies for bringing this up yet again, but this is obviously a pretty sizable rookie mistake that we can all learn from. Don't let your ego get in your way. What is, is. Don't confuse the issue with facts, as I often say. And as I alluded to a second ago also, and trust me, I'm not immune, a couple of weeks ago, I did the mistake of the week, and hopefully this is not a reoccurring <laughs> segment for my Trading Simplified show. One thing I've been doing lately is trying to come up with different segments, and that's how the mystery charts came up. And that's I ripped that off from David Keller, but it's pretty good. I take these, and I'll show you one in a few minutes. I take charts out of the trading service or the Facebook group, and these are before they trigger usually, and I show them, and then I follow up on what happened, good, bad, and indifferent. Well, this was one of those mystery charts that we talked about in the Facebook group. Before we do that, this week's mystery, this week's mistake of the week is brought to you by, you are doing it wrong. Voting, you are doing it wrong. So we talked about this one a couple of weeks ago. As you know, the money management looks to get a swing trade out and I ended up selling half of it at about a nine or eight and a half point profit. And then I trailed my stop up to break even. Well, for various reasons that I mentioned last week or week before when I first showed this, the market was getting a little iffy. I was getting stopped out of some trades and going through a little bit of a drawdown. And I just didn't want to give up any more open profits, even though my stop was at 50 and I still had another point and a half or so to go. And so I'm like, F this, I'm out. So I got out somewhere around here, about a point and a half above the stop. Felt pretty good because I was able to put a little tiny bit of money into my account. And that's the sell right there at 51.23. So I made a buck 23 on the trade. And I did this across multiple accounts. And look what happened. The stock takes off without me. So I violated my rules, micromanaged myself out of position. Now, why would I show you this? Well, one, so you could learn from it, and two, so it causes enough pain. So next time, I just follow my plan. And I was talking with one of you guys earlier. It's pretty easy for me to follow my plan on a direct recommendation in a trading service, and that's because I have a stop that I recommend, and if I get stopped out, then I'm stopped out. If I'm not stopped out, I'm like, oh, man, it sucks looking at that big loss in my portfolio, but hey, if I'm not stopped out, I'm not stopped out and I'll stay with it anyway. Anyway, having that plan written out and published forces me to trade it. So the way I look at it, this was a $1,016 mistake times X because I did it across multiple accounts and counting, at least when I did this, it was counting. It has retraced a little bit, but even where it is today, I'd still be up quite a bit. So that was a pretty ugly mistake. 
Now, just by the way, forget about trying to look smart, be a trend following moron. As I've said ad nauseum, when I was first called that, it was by a trader who I respected when I first met the guy, and I'll publish the whole story one day. But when the guy first contacted me, it was kind of a pinch me kind of moment. And then I actually met him in New York and we had dinner and we talked until the wee hours of the morning. And it was really a bit of a, really a pinch me moment for me. And I was so excited to meet this, this person that was here, that was a hero to me at least. And a little word of advice, don't meet your heroes. <laughs> Anyway, I've since met some, some really wonderful people. So that was many, many years ago. I've met some great people since then that I respected, like Greg Morris and Larry Millen and Linda Rasky and quite a few others. So he was really the only hero that I wasn't uh, that I was very disappointed in meeting after the fact. Because he later called me a trend following moron. I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure it was him. And the reason he did that was because he was a he was fighting a market and losing a lot of money. And I was drawing my big stupid blue arrows. And I think he wanted me to shove him up my arse. <laughs> and he told me I was nothing but a trend following moron. The full story is, I think it's pretty interesting. I'll get it published at some point. Now, more to the point, getting back to the rookie mistakes, confusing the issue with facts. If you poke around the net a little bit, you'll see that there's been some famous hedge fund managers this year who are losing billions and billions and billions of dollars. And one, and I don't want to pick on this one gentleman because I do respect him, but he's down 25%. And some of these people are quoted as saying, people are dying and they're all caught up in this coronavirus thing. And, and believe me, I was really caught up in it too. And the market was going down and it's like, okay, well, the my feelings jive with the market action and then the market starts going up and it's like well what do you do well i'm a trend following more and i guess i gotta get long and it seems like these people are still stuck caught up confusing the issue with facts and and you know we might not be out of this mess for a while i don't know but as long as the market's going higher i'm going to keep being a trend following moron even if that doesn't make any sense other than in the charts now I think over the years, I've probably not given out enough tough love. And over the last five years or so, I'm becoming more of a tough love kind of person because a lot of people will make the same mistake over and over again. And I keep telling them, don't do that, don't do that. And at some point, at one person in particular, maybe six or seven years ago, I finally had to cut him off because he was not listening. And he also didn't have any skin in the game and and not to soft sell you, but this was a gentleman that I said, look, you know, I thought he was mentally challenged and, and that's putting putting it nicely. And that's pretty much an insult to the mentally challenged because <laughs> this guy didn't email me for 10 years. And I'm like, geez, you know, my first book, I don't know, if, I don't think any other books were out at that point in time. Maybe the second one was out, but I was like, you know, this is all covered way back in the first book. Just read that. He's like, oh, I've been meaning to get that. Didn't even read the first book, but I think that a lot of these things, at least you'll know what mistakes you're making, and at least you'll know you're making a choice by going through those, those three courses. Lawrence says, the holistic trader course is brilliant. Done it and want to do it again every year. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of all that stuff and looking to make it even better in future versions. Now, you're going to make mistakes, okay? Learn from them. I make mistakes. I, that was a stupid rookie mistake I did a couple of weeks ago when I micromanaged myself out of a trade. Wang Yang Ming, not to be confused with the Wu-Tang Clan, the sages do not consider that making no mistakes is a blessing. They believe rather the great virtue of man lies in his ability to correct his mistakes and continually make a new man of himself. Now that's a little philosophical, but if you can learn from your mistakes and try not to make the same mistake twice, because if you make the same mistake twice, it's a choice. So if I micromanage, it's been a while since I micromanaged myself out of position, other than that one I just did. So I have a feeling I'm not gonna do that for a while, especially after showing you guys. Now, one mistake that I am guilty of quite often, I've done it a lot this year, and I've really 
had to reel myself in quite a bit while we're having confession time. And that is trading because the risks are small versus the rewards are big. Like, ah, I only lose a few hundred dollars if it goes south on me. Who cares, you know? Well, that adds up. As I often say, if you lose $100 a day, assuming there are roughly 252 trading days a year, that's what all my formulas are based on for something like historical volatility because you only make... You only there's uh, holidays obviously involved and weekends. I saw his, these YouTube people need to get it straight. I saw YouTube guru guru ad make a thousand dollars a day trading. It's like okay, and then they said, what year you'll make three hundred fifty two thousand? I'm like, do you know that the market is closed on weekends? How are you going to make a thousand a day on the weekends? But I digress. But anyway, the thing to kind of look at is if you lose two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred. Nine hundred thousand dollars a day. That's a lot of money over the course of a year. And a lot of times it's like, ah, eh, you know, three or four hundred dollars. Well, before you know it, you're into six figure figures of loss. And if you do that over and over again, if you do it every day, obviously, you're going to be a hurting pup and run down a sizable account fairly quickly. So that's one mistake that's pretty common, and I'm probably guilty as anyone so don't trade because the risks are small trade because rewards are big another mistake i see over and over again and i i was i had a brutal lesson in this in 2000 and then i wrote about it quite a bit and i've chimed in some forms and all because i was still buying stocks even though the market had rolled over and you got to be really careful not to fight that last war and and now, for the last 20 years, or at least, when people ask me, hey, how's the market? Now, ask me like in February or March of this year or April, I'm like, doesn't look good. It's going down. You're always bearish. <laughs> it's like, well, ask me when the market is going up. And then I think it was June or so, we started getting long again. Uh, we were a little late to the party, which is usual for, or often usual, especially the V-shaped type recovery. Anyway. Long story endless, you gotta be careful not to fight the last war and kind of be willing to to go with the tide. And I don't know if it's GC Selden or I'm trying to think who said it. I read it last night, but basically it's it's the goal of a trader is not to necessarily to figure out where the market's gonna go, but more so to go with it to kind of go with the tide to be a trend following moron and believe me it's hard a lot of times to be a trend following moron because you want to try to outsmart the market like i did on micromanagement talking with somebody recently who's beginning to i'm not going to say blow up but has lost a lot of money over a short period of time that took him a long time to to build up and his argument was, but it was working so well. Well, the the Robin Hood guys have printed a lot of money this year because the volatility worked for them and the stocks that they were trading, those little crazy go-go stocks that they were chasing, they had lots and lots of greater fools to push that market higher. And I don't know if if his trading was related to that, or you know, I didn't dig in deep enough to figure out what exactly it changed but i was trying to explain to him that things changed quickly volatility changed quickly so i think he was capitalizing on the volatility and the volatility came off quite a bit you look at the hv on the s p 500 and a few months ago it was pretty crazy but it's since really come off and that's something that we talk about quite often so you got to be careful not to fight the last war or get caught up in what's known with economic I can't say that word. <laughs> Economists call the permanent income hypothesis. You think just because you're doing well, you're going to keep doing well. I just received a phone call. Somebody, somebody's a friend of a friend ran their account up to, um, like 100% over a short period of time. And they think that they're going to keep doing that. And it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. 
But I digress. It was right before I came live because I was hearing the story. Now, there's a trader's dilemma. You can't lose any money if you don't trade. And that's one way, if ever you find yourself in a drawdown, number one, stop digging. Don't put on any new trades. Now, you might have to let those other trades work their way out. And that's one reason why I probably micromanage myself. I got to keep stop beating myself up and move on. But, you know, I was getting pretty hit pretty hard on a bunch of other trades and the market was kind of rolling over not that long ago. So I started stopping out as I should at the stop on some other trades. And then that's like, eh, I'm just going to clean up, clean this one out. So I'm not saying clean out your portfolio as soon as you hit a drawdown, but just be really selective about putting on any new trades. But you can't lose any money if you don't trade. But the dilemma is you can't make any money if you don't trade. Now, you have to learn to separate the fear of missing out trade, the FOMO or FOMAT trade, from the mother of all trades, okay? And I'm working on an acronym on this. I had it, M-O-A-O, -O. MOA. Sounds kind of Hawaiian, doesn't it? Now, a FOMO trade is a mistake trade, and, and my FOMO trades, like I said earlier, when, eh, you know, I can only lose a little bit. I don't know if I sound like Lucy, but, eh, and I take the trade. I end up losing the lose. It seems like in, I usually always lose a little bit when I think that way, and then after doing that a few days in a row, I realize, hey, that's starting to add up. I better quit. And then there's the must take trade. If you have the mother of all trades, you have to take it. And as I say, in nearly every show, it's kind of the Jimmy Rogers thing. I just wait until there's money lying in the corner and then all I have to do is walk over there and pick it up. And that was from, I think the first Market Wizards. And that is something that I need to tell myself on every trade and so do you. It's like, is this the mother of all trades? And the other thing you do, and it's something that will, will probably come up in future slides or later tonight, is that you have to really ask yourself, what would happen if it took off without you? Could you live with yourself? Is this really the greatest setup in setup town? And if it is, you have to take it. But if not, if you're kind of like, eh, so what? And that's the hard part is like watching something take off without you when you were actually contemplating the trade. Now, I don't have, I'm trying to think who first said this. In some of my slides, I couldn't find it before I went live. But doing nothing is harder than it looks. And I forget who first said that. And this is especially true for the motivated and successful outside of trading. So if you're a successful doctor, lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic, a lot, a lot of times you think that you could just transfer that success. And before I digress too, point, too far, the point is you became successful by taking a lot of action. It's very hard for you not to take action. And as I've said, ad nauseum, you're trained to take whatever train wreck comes along. And you can't sit around and wait for the perfect client. Now, last week we talked about this as a bus take trade. And I went back and I listened to what I said because I wanted to see what I thought about this talk. And I'm pretty sure I'm like, Guys, I really like this setup, and I'm always hesitant to say that because I'm worried that somebody's going to pile into it and said, well, you said you really liked it. Well, you know, I like a lot of trades that don't work, but this one I remember really, really, really liked. I like that LAC trade, too, that we talked about, I think it was last week. Anyway, I went back and played the video, which you can get at davelander.com slash archives, and I said, very, very, very nice persistent trend followed by a very orderly pullback. A little bit of a knockout move in the last bar. So I like that emphatically. And that's what it looked like. And I'm gonna show you the rest of this trade in just one minute. But this is BCLI. And you can look down at the bottom. We have lots of Landry light, a nice little pullback here to the 30 day EMA. So I'm using the 30 EMA with the Landry light lately, I find that's a that's a good moving average to use in my third book. I keep wanting to call it my last book because I got a book in my head, but it's so much damn work to do a book. <laughs> It'll kill you. But I am working on it here and there. And 
anyway, I talked about a pullback to the 20 EMA after Landry Light. And I think in the book I called it Daylight. But lately, I like the 30 because a lot of these go-go stocks like this one, for instance, which ran up over 100% or more by requiring them to come down to the 30, you get a little bit deeper pullback. Now, keep in mind, I don't always look at it and say, oh, this is a Landry Light pullback. I just kind of eyeball the chart mostly. But if you're newer to trading or if you lost your way a little bit, maybe you're going through a drawdown because you're chasing too many rabbits like we talked about in presentations prior, or you're firing off too many trades because the risk isn't that great, okay? Like we said earlier, risk is small. Then maybe come back to one simple pattern, and I don't want to say quantify, but something that's easy to kind of qualify and recognize, like the Landry Light pullback. So nice little pullback to the moving average you can see in the Landry Light below. This counts the number of days you are above the moving average. So you can see we got up to about 50 days above the moving average and then came back to zero because it intersected the moving average. Now, we'll come back to that trade in just one minute because there's a few more lessons in that. Last week, we talked about this. I did add one or two new ones, so I, I want to go over it one more time, but I'm going to go pretty quickly on this. A must-take trade needs to be trending, okay? There's somebody that comes to these presentations. He's going away for a while. I'll kick him out whenever he shows up because he always asks about shitty stocks. Oh, I just demonetized my video. Damn it. <laughs> anyway, he asked about stocks that go either chop that, that chop around or go sideways, you know. And I had somebody a while back. It's like, uh, I'm not coming to your shows anymore. You hate all my stocks. And it's like, well, start picking better stocks. It's like, remember Liar Liar? It's like uh, you know, Billy's on the phone. He just knocked over an, another ATM. He wants to know what to do. And Jim Carrey's character, character couldn't couldn't lie. And he picks up the phone and he goes, stop breaking the law. <laughs> so starts bringing me some trending stocks. Now, and, and you know what? I don't want to make fun of anyone or pick on anyone. But if you show me some crappy stocks, like we talked about a crappy one last week that somebody had brought up, but they're new to the methodology. You know, welcome aboard. We're going to get you up to speed and we're going to get you some better stocks. So uh, trades cleanly or persistent trend. It tends to go up day after day after day after day. When it pulls back, it's nice and clean, just like that BCLI, which we'll come back to in just one second. And the other thing is trades like electric cardio. You can kind of hear that beep, beep, beep in your head. It's accelerating in trend versus decelerating in trend. Now, the I do like the Landry like pullbacks. And again, I think that's the one pattern if, at least right now, if you're newer to the market or if you lost your way, that you should probably trade as your one pattern. All you need is one pattern to be successful, as Linda Rasky said. I agree with Linda. But what I would encourage you to do is also become a good chart reader and look at the chart and say, okay, well, it's had a nice trend base of the Landry light and it's pulled back to moving average, but is it is it accelerating or is it decelerating in that trend? And that's pretty easy to eyeball once you go through a few charts. Is a Landry light positive for the trend or is it a little or negative Landry light? And I'll show you that in one second when we get to the, the market analysis. Is it an obvious setup? And then a lot of times it's like setup. So somebody asked me about an S&P futures trade and I'm not sure what that setup is. So David, if you're here tonight, David S, when we get to your question, let me know what your setup was. Also, let me know what the parameters are too on that because I think you've got the entry and the stop mixed up or something. The net net is significant based on the volatility. Where's the market today? Where was it a few months ago? Okay, that DCLI is up about 200% and it looked pretty darn good. Is the net net nil or negative? Sometimes people will point out charts and they ask me about them and they've been going down for three months, sometimes much, much longer. It's like that is not an uptrend. Now, one thing that I added below is recreational trading. I know someone that's in quarantine, and before he was in quarantine, he would trade for about a half an hour or so, right around the open, and that's that's his shtick. He also follows my methodology, and he just calls those trades in, and he basically told me those trades don't stress him out at all because he's been doing it for years with me. And he knows some are going to lose and some are going to win and some are going to win, win really big. But overall, he knows that he's going to do okay in following that. So he just calls his orders in and forgets about it. 
But recently he's in quarantine because he was exposed. And I, I, I kind of saw it coming. He's doing a little recreational trading. He used to trade around the open. And he's he's did a little trading around the open lately and done really well. But then in the afternoon, he just can't stand it anymore because he can't leave the house. And he's starting to do some recreational trading. And that's gotten him into a lot of trouble really fast. So last week, we talked about the must take over the mistake trade. And you want to stay in the top half of this chart. And it's okay to get frustrated if you take a must take trade and have a negative outcome. You just have to shout next emphatically. And was it, I forget who it was. I want to say Winston Churchill that said, success is going from one failure to another without any loss of enthusiasm. And it's not really a failure, even though the bottom line is the bottom line. I know it's, it's hard to feel good about losing money. But if you lose money on a trade that you should have taken after you do your post mortem, then you need to scream next. And the one thing Churchill said, thank you, Lauren. Churchill said that. So, one thing I've been talking about a lot lately, I beat the dead horse on the post mortem. And I think it's also important to do the pre-mortem and sort of time travel and say, okay, I'm going to take this trade. And how am I going to feel if I get stopped out? I mean, nobody's going to be happy if I get stopped out, right? You know, I dropped plenty of F-bombs in this office. But if you can live with yourself, okay, if I take this action, can I live with this action? And you know what? That probably works for life, okay? If I stay up late tonight, can I live with being tired tomorrow, okay? If I've got a busy day tomorrow. Like last night, I stayed up a little late, and I said, you know what, Dave? You better go to bed because you're going to be here from 4.55 in the morning till 7 or 8 or whatever it is at night, whenever we get done tonight, and that's going to be a long day. And if you don't get a good night's sleep, you'll be tired. So that kind of goes for life, too. How will you feel in the future? It's kind of like might be a little bit too late, but there's a pool party that I've been invited to in a couple of weeks for somebody who just put a new pool in. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, if it's a couple of months out, maybe I can think about it. If it's in the middle of winter, I wouldn't have to worry about it. It's like, how am I going to feel when I show up as a, as a fat bastard? You know, you have to kind of time travel. So do that pre-mortem on the trade. And I can tell you with 100% conviction that the LAC trade and the BCLI, those are two that stand out quite a bit lately. I can tell you with 100% conviction going in, I feel like, hey, if this doesn't work out and I saw that same setup tomorrow, I would take it. And that's that's what you get to at the, at the postmortem, but try to get there ahead of time. And Ian Robinson wrote a book called Mind Sculpting. It's pretty good where he talks about how you sort of imagine you're doing those things. And the argument that he makes is, let's say like an alpine skier breaks his leg, God forbid, or, or gets some, let's just make it a little bit less injury, you know, has a really bad sprain or something. He's out for three or four weeks or six weeks or whatever the case may be. If he sits around and plays video games that whole time, he's going to have a hard time getting back on the slopes. But if he mind sculpts and imagines that he's actually skiing and he's he's seeing the course in his head and he's making the, and before you know it, and it's been proven, if you start thinking about doing certain things, your body will kind of begin to move. Your brain will begin to almost think it's really happening. Our brains are, are kind of dumb in a way to where they can be tricked. So again, that's kind of the, his whole point of the book, just kind of gave away the whole thing. Sorry about that. But uh, it's listed on Books 3, www.davelandry slash books-2-3. The link will come up in the edited version of this. Anyway, long story endless, do that mind sculpting going in. I talked a lot about that in trading full circle, and some of it might be in the courses on the gold members area too. Now, at the bottom, as we discussed last week, the trade that's a mistake, the worst thing you could have that could happen to you is you take a mistake trade, a trade you should not have taken and you feel like your results were just unlucky well then you get stuck in that negative feedback loop read annie duke's thinking in bets 
She has a lot of good stuff to say there. Somebody told me last week she's got a new book coming out, so I'm looking forward to that. But thinking and bet was thinking and bets was really good. I really enjoyed that. So, like I said, I want to focus mostly on solving the problems before they occur, but I still have a big stack of problems that have been submitted. So let's take a look at one or two of those, and then I want to shift gears and get into market timing. I took the actual symbol out of this because I don't think it's relevant relevant anymore. Anyway, I went, I'm in XYZ. It went up at the beginning and then came down and has gone sideways. My problem is the volume has dried up. Do you think the volume will go back up when the stock price goes back up or should I just get out of my position now? Well, you gotta kind of be in for a penny, in for a pound. And you gotta be careful not to have all that mental masturbation once you get into a trade, especially if the trade begins to go against you. As long as you're not stopped out, stick with the trade. And again, doing nothing is harder than it looks. And I was trying to find that quote and so many people had posted that because of the quarantine. A lot of people found out really quickly, like, man, wouldn't it be great to just hang around the house all day and then you get to hang around the house all day. Except for me, <laughs> my work actually went up, you know, because, which is a good thing. I'm not complaining because a lot of people are like, hey, I think I might trade now that I'm bored in quarantine. Anyway, the BCLI trade, this was it going back to early August, 1410 entry, 1070 was a stop, and that's 3.4 risk. So you add that to the entry, and that gives you 1750 as the IPT. And this is what it looks like on the chart. Again, nice, nice, nice Landry light higher. What did I say earlier? You want to see a stock that's going up and accelerating. You don't want to see it just kind of rolling over and then kind of rolling over and then kind of grinding higher slowly and then just kind of kisses that moving average. In this case, again, it ran from let's say five or even lower up to 15. That's like a 300, well, actually more than that. That's like a 300% run. So a lot of momentum in this stock and there's your Landry light down below, many, many days of Landry light about 40 or 50 above the moving average as you can see up top. And then it comes down and gives the moving average a little bit of kiss. It did have one day below the moving average, but I'm not going to get too excited about one day after such a fantastic trend. It's also a very persistent trend. Like I talked about earlier, you could draw a line through almost every one of these bars. Mathematically, that's known as linear regression. If you get really bored, I would suggest you draw some linear regression lines in your charts, or better yet, just try to draw a line or use your mind, mind's eye and see if you could intersect nearly most of the bars. And the ones that, like this one right here, if you draw a line on here, this would be outside of that line, but it's to the upside. So that would be a positive thing. So anyway, entries up here, the stop was down here, and the initial profit target was up here. So let's take a look at what happened. So it triggers an entry, and then what happens? Nothing, absolutely nothing. It starts going down, it starts going sideways. And unfortunately, we start getting some negative Landry light. So what do we do? Well, nothing, because it did not hit the stop. But at this point, you're probably thinking, this is dead money. Dead money is defined as a position that has little or no chance of any appreciable gains. Well. If you do that, like the Beaky trade, I got to stop beating myself up on that. So last, this is the last show here of the Beaky. We're going to put that to bed. But you know, when you make a mistake, and this is what something I was talking with with someone earlier, something I was talking with somebody earlier, easy for me to say. And he was really down in the dumps because he did incredibly well, and then he kind of the wheels came off the bus a little bit, or the wheels came off whatever. And not to mix my metaphors. But he was really down on himself. And I'm like, you got to feel enough pain so you don't make the same mistake again, okay? But you can't feel so much pain that it cripples you and you can't act when the next great looking setup comes along. So anyway, getting back to this particular setup. So it did not set up, stop out, so there's nothing to do. And then if we fast forward a little bit, it did come really close to the profit target. And I did not take profits when it came close, although I was getting ready to, and I started thinking, well, let me see if it's gonna hit it, because I like I like my peeps. I don't wanna get out in front of my peeps, but in this particular case, I probably should have not worried about it and just gotten out. But I was able to 
peel off half of those shares today. So it did hit the initial profit target. So it would have been really easy to micromanage yourself out of this trade. A few of you here I noticed were, I know you were in this particular trade. I'd be curious to say, and nobody could see, and I won't say your name, but if, if somebody here tonight took this trade and micromanaged himself out of it, and not to be shot in Friday, but I'd just like to know, just for my own knowledge to to kind of like see like to show that people do that okay and the, point, the reason i'm making that is it, every now and then not that often i've only had a few over my career that went to service but there were a few stocks of the service that got bought out but it seems like most of them just went sideways for a while before they got bought out and i received a lot of emails saying that man i i got, I got tired of it going sideways thing went sideways for a month i thought it was dead money so I got out. So I'd be curious to know if anybody micromanaged themselves out of this. And I promise I won't pick on you. I'm just curious to see. I, I'd be willing to bet that AU trade, remember that AU trade? I almost grabbed that trade to show you, but it's 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 on my, um, in my stock chart show. We talked about it quite a bit. We got in a little gold stock, AU, and it just, it just grinded sideways for months and months and months and months and months. And I'd be willing, months, and I'd be willing to bet most people gave up on it. Well, you've got to follow your plan. You've got to follow the system as painful as it often is, because longer term, you're going to do just fine. Longer term, you're going to catch those elusive little outliers that make your year. And longer term, you're going to catch a few little decent trades in the meantime, like the LAC trade really didn't work out that well, but at least we got a swing trade off where it came back in. Okay, John says, I sold half. First time in a while I did that, but at least I kept half. Fantastic. Market was making me nervous. Yeah, and that's the thing. And, and you know, I I, did, I didn't follow my plan again because I had to go back and look at my notes. But I think part of the problem, if memory serves, was that I was getting stopped out of my other positions. And I'm like, oh, boy, here we go again. And I've seen that happen in the service over and over again. We'll have like four or five positions on the market starts to tank. And then one by one, we get systematically taken out of trades and people are like, well, let's just get out of these other two or three. I'm like, no, let's stick with it. And most people it's like, no, screw that. You know, I'm gonna sell first and ask questions later. And unfortunately, if you're not stopped out, when you do that, the one that you decide to exit early is the one that ends up taking off as Murphy will have it. Now, a problem that was sent to me was just simply one word, patience. Oops. I've done complete presentations just on patience. So I just want to touch upon it briefly. Just a few things that kind of get you started to becoming patient. And that's the hardest thing. Again, doing nothing is harder than it looks. But if you trade a really small size, it's not going to stress you out one way or the other, and you could get used to holding on to things for a while until stopped out or until your initial profit target is hit and you trail that stop higher. I have some little small accounts which I could care less. It, I don't get up, I don't go nuts or whatever. I've got some little crypto accounts, uh, two or three of them out there. And, you know, I make these crypto trades and just kind of forget about them. You know, I check on them once a day, if that much. Keep in mind that the market rarely moves on your time frame and to your expectations. And a lot of reading I've been doing lately on the trading psychology sort of sort of has me thinking that going back to like the DCLI, it's like it's this perfect little setup at the time, but then as soon as you place that trade, everything begins to, to change. Maybe somebody will put out a tweet <laughs> or something, okay? Who knows? It happens. I guess I could say it now to demonetize my video. Uh, sometimes what you can do is use hard orders, okay? As I said earlier, the gentleman was talking about he trades my stuff, but it's I wouldn't even call it trading my stuff. He looks at the service and he calls his order to a secretary who makes the trades for him, okay? And 
he actually uses hard stops. I think he uses a little bit more liberal hard stops and just forgets about it. I know, is it Lawrence that uses, that you use like liberal hard stops because you don't want to wake up and trade all night, Lawrence in Australia. But you could use hard orders. Uh, you know, th th there's a psychology behind a hard, hard stop order too. I don't always use hard stop orders. If I'm super busy or know I'm going to leave the office, I'll I'll, I'll go in and put a, put in hard orders. Hard orders. That's hard to say. But I would recommend you use them if you are having trouble with discipline and patience, especially if the stock is a ways away from your stop. Okay. Then you can go about your life and you can let the market make that decision for you. So there's a little bit more trading psychology that's kind of working into all this too, by having that hard order in place. You could stop that or you stopped out. Now, as you become a little bit more disciplined and patient, then you could say, okay, well, my stop is, let's say my stop's at $20. I'm going to set an alert at 20 and a half. And if that alert gets hit, then I'm going to see if it just kind of comes in and nicks my stop a little bit and then turns around and goes right back up. And that's applying a little bit of, excuse me, that's applying a little bit of discretion. And that will help your performance longer term, but only once you get the discipline. And it does require a lot of discipline to do that because what you might do is you're like, oh, well, okay, it's at 20. Let me just give it a little wiggle room. Oh, it's at 1975. Okay, well, I'm going to get out of 1950 no matter what. Oh, it's at 1925. Before you know it, you're not out of the trade, and the next day it gaps down five points against you. So using hard orders will help to give you patience. Stay busy. As I preach, I stay crazy busy. If I'm not crazy busy, I will be firing off trades, as I think I said in prior shows or recent prior shows. Sometimes I'll look at like the intraday futures or something, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go get a little lunch. And when I get back from lunch, or if I walk to the house to say hello to the wife or do whatever I do, it seems like every time I walk back in the office and look at the screen, it's like, oh, it's set, it's ready to go again. You know, it's not always a trade. It can't it can't be that much of a coincidence. So stay busy and just let things work out. And when I do an intraday trade, like an ogre trade or something, I had one didn't work out yesterday, DraftKings or, or whatever, or day before. And it was an opening gap reversal yesterday. And I had a stop here, I had a limit order here, and I just, I forgot about it. I wasn't, I wasn't happy that I stopped out, but I'm like, eh, just let it go and see what happens. And that's a kind of, trading you need to do if you're going to be doing the intraday trading or even on the position trading it's probably good to stay very 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 busy i know a doctor who struggled with his trading he's a good he's a good chart reader he makes a lot of money and then kind of you know like i said earlier whatever the wheels come off the bus or whatever <laughs> i don't know if that's the right metaphor comes the wheels come off the whatever but he started trading really well. And, and he's like, hey, I'm doing really good. And I'm thinking, hey, did the grand poobah hits because you're, you got the grand poobah, at least that's what I'm thinking in my head, helping you. But before I went to pat myself on the back, I'm like, oh, well, what's, what's changed? And he's like, the doctor that was running the hospital at night quit. Now I'm literally working day and night. I don't have time to trade. So it's like, ah, okay. So that one little change in his life improved his trading. He didn't have time to sit around and look at the screen and micromanage himself out of trades. Now, in uh, I was looking for this earlier. This is uh, this is a pretty good book, Scott Adams' book, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. Kind of the story of my life. It's kind of a story of my life too, <laughs> Scott. And I couldn't find it, but somewhere in here he talks about how discipline gets used up and patience gets used up so let's say you're on a diet and you wake up and you eat whatever's on your diet and then you eat for lunch eat whatever's on your diet and for supper you eat whatever's on your diet and then an hour or two later you're hungry and you're like screw it you know <laughs> or if you like today i planned on exercising i planned on jumping on the peloton but i kind of let one thing after the other 
get in my way. Had I jumped on it earlier in the day, I would have gotten my exercise in and I'd be feeling really good right now. But because I, my discipline, I just kind of, it slowly wears down. It's like you wake up in the morning, you have so much patience, you have so much discipline, and then it kind of slowly wears down. If you want to get serious about your exercise, obviously you wake up and the first thing you do is you exercise and then it's done. Then you don't need to have 12 hours or 13 or 14 hours of discipline to, to then say, I'm going to exercise after that. Because patience and discipline, trust me, gets used up. Commit to commitment devices. And I talk about a lot of these different commitment devices. I know that if I hired a trainer and told the trainer, we're going to meet on these days and we're going to train. And I told the trainer, and I'm stealing what a buddy of mine did a few years back as an example. But if I told the trainer, I was like, look, if I don't show up, I'm going to give you 50 extra bucks for a no-show. Plus, I'm going to pay you for training that you did not do. <laughs> and I have a, a pretty good idea that I would probably get to the gym. I'm still a little germaphobe about the COVID thing. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. You know, it's like this party I got to go to is like, is it outside? My wife's like, it's a pool party. He's like, okay, fine. All right. <laughs> and everybody's going to be tested there before you go. No, I think you, and unfortunately, we're, I think we're forced to start to live our lives. Anyway, the commit to, commitment device is another example. This gentleman that was doing a lot of recreational trading, he literally deleted the app off his phone today. Now, he's probably going to download it tonight, but that's another story. Just go with me for a while. So that's his commitment device. And he's making that bad habit hard. And what's his name? James Clear talks a lot about acrasia and acrasia is like the procrastinating things and, and doing like taking that SMG type of trade where you feel like, ah, it's not that much risk. Because if you do these things, you kind of feel like what's what's it gonna hurt? And but you're stealing from your future self when you do those type of things. Anyway, long story endless, he said when he talks about being committed and disciplined and avoiding the acrasia, it's not as much about making bad habits hard, but more importantly, making good habits easy, okay? But I think you can do both. Now, we talked about these in prior weeks, so let me just go through it real quick. The good news is, if you've been trading for a while, you know what you're doing wrong, okay? And if you're not sure and you've been trading for a while, I have a feeling that if I looked at your trades and you're supposed to be a trend follower like I am and you're taking trades that are going straight down, then that's probably your problem. Or if you're doing a lot of day trades, like I gave the example a while back, somebody said, oh, I'm not making any money with the service. I need you to look at my trades. And I'm like, okay, fine, let's take a look. And it's like, okay, well, you took every trade perfectly with the service and you made a little bit of money. We weren't printing money back then. But he would have been in the black had he not taken 20 something day trades in one particular issue. And when I when I said, hey, good news, you know, and I told him everything I just said, he's like, uh, I know, I know. So he knew, he knew before he sent me his portfolio. Garbage in, garbage out, practice, deliberate practice. As I preach, I look at a couple thousand stocks each day. Whenever I see a big move, I ask myself how could I have caught that move? Should I have caught that move? Were there any of my patterns there? And not everything's going to be a pattern. Sometimes things just go up and you have to learn to live with that. But the harder and harder you work at looking at a lot of charts, the better you get at chart reading. And I would practice that deliberate practice. What you want is usually not what is. And that's the hard part of trading. I got in a setup. I haven't taken too many setups lately. And that's because if you, if you notice the service, I haven't put out a whole lot of setups. But I did take one. That was in Landry List. And I think after the first day, it might have been up a little bit. Then it was down a little bit. And now it's up a little bit. And now it's back down a little bit today. And it's like, it's I'm like, why would this thing go up? It looks fantastic. And so what you want is usually not what is. And learning to live with that is key. Making decisions is easy. Learning to live with decisions is hard. Postmortems as I beat the dead horse are key. And I think pre-mortems is going to be my new favorite thing. And I think that could save your buttocks. And accepting the fact that a mediocre trade might take off without you is hard. But I think over the long run, 
because we have this selective perception with this combined with this FOMO, okay, you notice the mediocre trade that takes off without you that you would have made a shit ton of money on, right? You notice that, but you don't notice the other 10 trades that you didn't take because they were mediocre would have actually lost money. And net, net, you'd be losing a hell of a lot of money. So pre-mortem, like I said earlier, a crazy, is a, a crazy is a bitch, you know, putting off things and and thinking, oh well, I could just maybe make this trade or whatever, and then it's like, and then cursing yourself down the road. You know, along those lines, it's like many people, and I don't want to call anybody out because I make plenty of mistakes in my own life and all, but it's amazing and it's easy from the outside looking in at other people. Believe me, and I'm sure you're thinking the same thing. But think about somebody in your life that has a difficult life or often has a difficult life. And from the outside looking in, you're like, well, just stop doing these bad behaviors. Just stop doing this one thing. Or why, why do you allow these things to occur? It's pretty easy to see from the outside looking in. So a lot of hell is self-created, and that applies to life and to trading. Easy for me to see outside looking in, and then it's a constant in introspection. I think that's that's something important to do is just constantly look within yourself and again if you had a great setup that you should have taken and it fails so what and it comes back to following the process and that's a lot of the the any dupe book i mentioned a few minutes ago would be good to read about that commit to commitment devices james clear is a good book and then just kind of think about what you could do to possibly not make so many trades if you're over trading and so on and so forth. And if you're having trouble taking trades that look great, well, before they trigger, put in a hard order and go about your life. Many times, as I often say, I'll hear a little ding and I'm like, what's that? And I go look at my trading monitor. And it's like, oh, I forgot that I even placed that order this morning for that particular stock. Now, I'm going to go over this kind of quickly because I did a whole show on this just yesterday. And what I had set out to do with the TFM 10% system is just create a simple system to show that market timing can be done and that market timing could be fairly simple. And the most important thing that I wanted to do, not so much was to beat the pants off of buy and hold, which I hoped to do, obviously, but more importantly, I wanted to avoid the huge drawdowns because every now and then the market loses half of its value. And that's fine if it comes back. And if is the key word in that sentence, and if you don't need the money, okay? And that could be really, really hard. It might take 25 years or more to come back. We've been, small, we've been spoiled in more recent times because the market has come back fairly quickly. Although it was, it was, was it 2008 slide, it took 13 years to come back or something like that. It took a while. So market timing is less about beating the market and more about not letting the market beat you. And I think avoiding the occasional 50% haircut is key. You will risk money. You will lose money in the markets. It's one of the few things I can guarantee. But I think it's important to be willing to fight and run away. The old hedge fund adage comes to mind. Comes to mind. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Now, Charlie Baleo and Michael Gayard did a paper where they talked about bad things happening below the 200-day moving average. So the point is that the market gets below the 200-day moving average and stays there, some bad things could happen. So my corollary to them is bad things happen below the 10% line. Now, the 10% line is defined as the 50-week closing high of a market less 10%. So I've showed this chart before, but that green line is what I call the buy line or the 10% line. And this is in Metastock and it's for free in Metastock. It's also in the ACP stock charts platform and it's also free. If you have stock charts, as I've been saying, if you like the video, you'll get it for free. There will be a little plug-in if you pull up ACP. I use this uh, Metastock in this case because the S&P data goes back a little further. But there'll be a little plug down here. Click on a plug and then just load my indicators. But you can see here, we've had a couple of bear markets where bad things happen once the market got below the 10% line. Now, a couple of times 
it did hit that 10% line and kind of bounce off on it. Well, that's kind of known as a as a whipsaw, okay? As Greg Morris says, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. Now that spill back in 2019, which I've talked about at nauseam, was a pretty serious slide. And I think if you didn't get out of the way, you're pretty stupid. But that's another story altogether. A lot of people said, oh, I'm holding on. <laughs> and then as you can see, obviously the market lost 28% after it clipped through that 10% line, okay? And we'll show you that in the spreadsheet. In fact, there it is right there. Now, when I came out with this system, I went back about 30 years and it was beating buy and hold, but it wasn't really, really setting the world on fire. And I was a little bummed out that it really didn't beat buy and hold by much. And then when I updated it recently, I'm kind of bummed out, like, wait a minute, buy and hold is actually beat it. But again, my goal wasn't to see if I could crush buy and hold. With a, this is a longer term system, by the way. And I'll touch upon that aspect in a few minutes. My goal was to avoid the diaper change moment. I don't know if I said it in this um, webinar or not, but diaper change comes from Ian McActivy, okay? And it's when something really, really bad happens. And something really, really bad did happen in 2000 and 2008. Now, keep in mind, this is after the exit. My whole premise, by the way, with this, just for people, I, I see a few new folks tonight here. Folks, I hate that word for some reason. <laughs> Just because like people who use it seem disingenuous, folks, you know, I don't know. I don't know why I've got that hang up. But anyway, a few new dudes here tonight. So the my premise is if a market's going to go from A to C, okay, and as long as it's like the ABC, right? If, if we're looking at like IPOs, for instance, I have a buy at B pattern. You look to buy when the market's at B. If it's going to go from A to C. It's going to have to pass through B along the way. Well, as long as it's somewhere between B and C or near C, then why not stay long, okay? But if it drops away from C, then maybe it's in trouble and it might be going back down through B and back down to A, unfortunately. So keep in mind that these numbers are what happens after the exit. So the market dropped another 44% in this case and then 52%. And then a last little slide, the market lost another 28% after a trigger in this system. Now, if you look at those last 30 years, about six and a half years or 21% of the time you were out of the market. So you were able to sleep other than possibly having a little FOMO, okay? But you also could feel like, hey, you know what? I might have a little FOMO, fear of missing out with this uptrend that seems to be developing, but I know that this system or other systems that are trend following in nature will get me back in the market. So you ended up making about 97% of what the buy and hold made with, and you're able to sleep at night when these horrible bear markets come along. And by the way, as long as you don't need the money for retirement and the market comes back, which it doesn't always do in a timely manner, you can live through a 50% or more drawdown. But if you need to retire and you have needs, and believe me, you always have needs, right? Life comes at you fast. You know, anytime I feel like, hey, everything's going great, bam, something just hits me, you know, out of the blue. I did get to thinking, what if I went really far back, like 100 years with this? How important would it be to avoid those diaper change moments? Well, it turns out it's pretty darn important. So here are the worst diaper change moments, 85%, 52%, and then some 40%, and then quite a few 20 something percent moves. And again, this is after the exit. So it's pretty ugly. And how's that for a oxymoron from a trend following moron? So what does it mean to performance if you're avoiding those big drawdowns, those diaper change moments. Well, the buy and hold, going back to January of 1928, would have made $1.8 million. The TFM 10% system would have made $6.3 million. 
And out of those 93 years round numbers in the market, 63 of those years it would have been out to the market. So 32% of the time you would have been out of the market. And that's when the market just goes down, 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 and shows little or no signs of recovering. So when you plot it out, it becomes a little bit more impressive. The TFM 10% system, 10% system is on the top, and the buy and hope is on the bottom. And you can see that avoiding those diaper change moments is pretty darn important. And it gets very impressive when you go through a bear market. So if we, or when, I hate to say it, but when we have another bear market, even if you just go back 30 years, this system will start performing really well once again. And, and go in and watch the presentation I did. It's on my website or click on uh, more lessons on the front page or whatever it is, whatever it says, a little arrow underneath the current lessons and watch this video. And I talk a lot about how that's, if the market would have, not came back as fast as it did, then this system would have gotten you in a lot, lot earlier. And the example I used was 2008, where the line just kind of like ratchets down with the market because it stayed down for so long. And I think 2002, 2003. So this was a this was to my YouTube video on the TFM temper system, 10 percent system. How about tightening up the time frame of the daily signals with EMAs? There's a lot of potential money between the similar moves on a daily, two as opposed to 50 to weekly, 50 or correlate swing signal, daily charts, et cetera, et cetera. So his point is, what about short-term systems? Well, I do have a lot of short-term systems and I'll, I'll show you something that was, I woke up in my head, in my head this morning. <laughs> I know, Dave, would you wake up thinking about changed quite a bit over these years, right? Anyway, we'll get to that in just one second, but we have, the bow ties, we have um, first thrusts, which are a little bit more, what's the word, uh, discretionary, arbitrary, I guess, but they should be pretty obvious, and quite a, a few other patterns. Now, what's interesting is this system actually had a sell signal on a weekly chart before the daily triggered, and that really got me thinking, holy moly, this could be the real deal. So Donald says, is the TFM temper test results long, short, or long only? Those are long only results, but if you, you know, that's a very interesting question, Donald. If you think about it, those, if you would have gone short on those diaper change things, you would have made a lot of money, 85% mm -hmm. in some cases, 48%, 28%, but I just wanted to show a long only systems to keep it simple but yeah actually when i started to look at what i'm going to show you right now i started doing a little hand testing and thinking that yeah this would be a long and short type of system so if you wanted to do something a little bit more shorter term now keep in mind that there could be a lot of whipsaw in this longer term much longer term but over the last year or so here it's been pretty damn impressive and all I'm doing is when we have 10 days of upside Landry light, I'm gonna say, let's go long the market, okay? And when we, and there's no money management, there's no exits here. I'm just showing you the moves that happen after that. And when you have 10 days of downside Landry light, and by the way, the TFM system triggered like right here or right here, somewhere in this little slide. And then we didn't get a daily bow tie or a first thrust or any other patterns for another week or so. So I thought that was pretty cool. So that last little run, once you had 10 bars of upside Landry light was 14%. To the downside, there was a 24.5% drop after 10 bars of, of Landry light. So what I'm trying to show you here is, is this has promise. And I like to throw out things as I kind of discover them, but I think this has promise or could be fodder, so to speak, for future research. And you can see on the upside after the 10 bars of upside Landry light. Now, again, this is a V-shaped recovery, or as I said in yesterday's presentation again, this V-shaped recovery is gonna take a system, a trend following system, a little bit longer to catch up with the market as opposed to if it's something bottoms out and then that moving average is really, really low and it comes above them or whatever other trend following technique you're using. Anyways, 
run so far and counting. So I think this would be something kind of fun to mess around with. You will get some chop here and there where it's going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. Okay. And, you know, maybe if you're not more than 10 to the upper 10 to the downside, that might be a good time to stay out of the market. Okay. But yeah, when I develop this further, and I'm not going to put too many rules into it, I want to keep it really simple so I can show how trend following works. Then I think that it should work pretty good. And I think it, it will have an edge longer term. And the point I'm trying to make with all this is that some market timing is better than nothing. Okay, David had a question. He bought a micro S&P and, okay, I didn't know what pattern he was using. He said, set a micro pullback in a base after a new daily high, long, okay. Yeah, well, I'm gonna need a little bit more I tell you what, David, next time, let's see, we could try to work through it tonight. But ideally, if you could actually send me a chart in these cases, and we'll take a look at that in just one second. Let me write down your parameters here. Your long one at 3412, round numbers, and your stop is at 3400. That's really tight, 12 points, because in a, in a heartbeat, that contract can move that much. Now, S&P futures is a really, really tough market to trade. I have a love-hate relationship with them. I love them. They hate my account. <laughs> Every day and then I catch a really, really good trend, and then uh, and then I get chewed up a lot. Efficient markets are incredibly tough to trade. So I would encourage you to play around with the Landry light, play around with bow ties on a five-minute chart. And then if you go in and watch the presentations I did where I did a lot of the compression and expansion analysis, Maybe look to trade on those days when everything's compressed, even though you might get chewed up a little bit, you know you're due to catch that trend day. But we'll take a look at that uh, trade when we get a second here for you, David. So if you become a gold member of daylander.com, it's pretty cheap. You have access to all those courses I mentioned, and you also have access eventually to longer term, uh, to the uh, premium courses. You unlock them over time. And the great thing about the Facebook group is that we all kind of help each other find setups. And I talk, I'll come chime in if something's going on with the service, like taking profits or stopped out or whatever. Okay, let's take a look real quick at the S&P trade. And um, I'm just thinking about this now. He had sent me this uh, request late in the in the evening, right before we went live. So I'm not sure of uh exactly what he's asking but let's let's take let's see if we can figure out best we can so let me get this shared uh i'm going to go through the market real quick i'm going to uh, answer the questions that are being asked and then we can start talking about individual stocks so if you want to start asking about individual stocks feel free to do so now so i think i have let's see where the futures so I have the futures somewhere in one of these in my Forex list. Oh, one thing I neglected to say while looking at this Landry light, okay, in the market and showing you those ups and downs that it would have caught just after 10 bars, everything works better with trend. This market went up for a long time, then it went down for a long time, and now it's going up for a long time, okay? So keep in mind that the markets do chop around. I know I make a lot more money if I just tell you how great it was. And then you went out and tried to do it like, why is it so hard? <laughs> so we take a look at Forex. I should have it. There it is. There's the E-minis right there. All right. Let me see if I can figure out what you did. So, David, you were doing a, um, a five-minute chart. Okay. Five-minute chart on the E-minis. And again, incredibly, incredibly tough market to trade. Let's go ahead and add in what oh shoot. You know what? I can't get I can't get five minutes. They don't have uh intraday charts here. So we'll have to pick that up based on our time crunch here. We'll have to pick that up uh next week. So do me a favor, send me a chart on that and we'll pick it up next week. Okay. Donald says pretty impressive results. Thank you. Yeah, send me a chart with the just mark it up. Show me when you got in and, and what were you thinking? 
I reduced to half when I went red and then added back to half when I went back. Okay. Yeah. You, you, okay. So Lawrence saying that he got stopped out on it or he, he, he got half, he got out of half of its trade when it was going negative and then he got back in. No, just follow the original plan and, and, and go with it. Okay. If you saw two identical setups, but one stock was 20 and the other was 200 a share, which one would you take? Um, if the volatility was the same, I'd probably take the $20 stock. And the reason is you're going to get a lot more shares off, okay? Because that $200 stock, if the volatility is the same, might have a 20-point stock stop, S-T-O-P. So you'd only end up with 100 shares, okay? So I would take the $20 stock in that particular case. And usually if, the, usually if you can't decide between two stocks, I usually take the one that's slightly more volatile. Let me uh, share this particular application. Let me share, share Telechart. I'm a little quicker with it. And then we'll uh, we go through a few things, and then we'll get to your questions and individual stock picks. SP 500, you can see up above the bow tie moving averages, and the bow tie moving averages are now in uptrend proper order. Nothing magical about that. We're kind of running out of time tonight, but as a general statement, if you stay long when the bow ties are in uptrend proper order, okay, what did we talk about earlier? Same kind of thing. You'd be long here, you'd be short here, and then you'd be long here. And I don't think, I don't know if they went to downtrend proper order there, but they're back at uptrend proper order now. Maybe they did, that would be what's called the whipsaw. It happens. Yeah, they did, so they did, okay. But you wouldn't have triggered, but if you were just blindly following the trend, you would have got whipsawed here, but now you'd be long once again. Uh, what's the symbol on that, uh, Peter? Because I don't know the symbol for everything. COS, NASDAQ Composites, Making brand new multi-week highs today, like the P is getting out of the range. Bow ties have turned back up. As I preach, one or two, yeah, I should have known that. One or two big up days can make all the difference in the world. I know most symbols, I really do. <laughs> You'd be surprised. As long as a big, thick stock, been around for a while. But that looks pretty good in NASDAQ. Some of these other areas are looking pretty good here. Drugs are breaking out to multi-week highs. Obviously, a few areas still lagging. Like energies have been abysmal for quite a while. So far, they're just kind of pulling back. Look at that. Look at that trend in the energies. I feel like Tony Elvis is huge, right? Okay. But most areas looking pretty good. Health services right at brand new highs. M and C material construction, brand new highs. And if you were to pop all these up in the ACP and use the Landry light or bow tie moving or proper order, you'd see there's some pretty good looking stocks. In here, the only other one I want to show you real quick would be the semiconductors. Look at that, bam! Look at that trend, it's huge, okay? So, it never did go downtrend proper order, which is kind of interesting in here. So, this whole thing was just kind of a consolidation, okay? All right, let's open it up for individual questions. More QA sessions for members only would be great, too. Yeah, Lauren, right now we've been doing such a good job in Facebook, or I should say, you guys have been doing such a good job in Facebook. I really don't have a tremendous amount of questions that need to be covered. And, and a lot, if you go through all the courses and you go through all the Q and prior Q&A sessions, a lot, that, a lot of that's covered. But yeah, that's that's definitely in the works. I will be doing more eventually, okay? Uh, Donna wants to talk about DraftKings. That was a stock that I tried to play the ogre on and it did not work. We were talking about on Facebook. And I, I know somebody got made money on that. I do like it. It did catch my eye tonight. The only thing I don't like is this gap, okay? I don't like a gap in the setup, but if this gap wasn't there and it's almost small enough to where I can look past it, but I'm, I'm a bit of perfectionist sometimes when it comes to setup. So I'd say it looks good, but um, I don't like the gap, okay? And it needs a tiny bit deeper pullback. Run, run looks good. Run needs a deeper pullback. I saw that earlier tonight. Um, when I was doing my research. So you got this is kind of a textbook TKO. Unfortunately, I think it needs a little bit more knockout move. HV is up about 80, okay, that's pretty high. So yeah, and a little bit more knockout move, entry right here, that looks beautiful. That's almost a high five worthy, Chris. Good job, good job. Kind of close to old highs, does that matter? On what? Woodstock, DKNG. Yeah, well, I like a deeper pullback, and that'll get you further away from, from new highs, okay? Okay, big C. Hey, Dakota. Yo, GC. <laughs> I'm glad the comments last night in the debate helped you out. That's good. 
both pulled back, resuming trend, no momentum, avoid. Yeah, I'd leave those alone because I'm a fan of the first deep retracement, but not 100% retracement. I mean, if anything, it's just kind of drifting in here. Uh, let's take a look at OSTK. OSTK is kind of a kind of more of a, like a short, okay? But it hasn't cracked, okay? So I would leave it alone too. Yeah, this there's other stock out to be like run, you know, that looks pretty good. Let's take a look at costs for Peter. Yeah, cost looks really good. Unfortunately, it needs a pullback. So, and it also needs to get a little further above this prior high in here. Put that in your momentum list. The HV is a little bit on the low side. Remember I said earlier, higher price versus lower price, but I prefer a lower priced stock if the volatility was the same. But this is a really low HV. I'd like to see a little bit more excitement, okay? Yeah, solar's been doing really, really well. And there's a few big ones that are kind of pushing this index higher. And I know one of you guys, I'm not gonna throw you under the bus. You were like, I'm gonna shark this thing because it's going straight up. I'm like, eh, a little bit of ego is rearing its ugly head there. You know, be careful with doing that. You know, don't fight the trend, okay? Yeah, so yeah, the, it has been going higher. Yeah, this GovX, I don't know if this is an IPO or, or not because it looks like an IPO IntelliChart, but on Thinkorswim, it, it does not. I actually threw this out in the Facebook group today because it's a buy at B setup. My only problem is it's less than five bucks a share. I like stocks to be a little bit higher in price for something like the buy at B. Now, if this was an oil company that's been going down for 10 years or a metals and mining company that's basing out or something that tend to be a little cheaper in price, then no problem. Yeah, Peter, I agree with you. You, 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 you get it. Peter says, shorty big momentum names are like sitting in front of a runaway train. Amen. Yeah, uh, gold and silver, I agree, Zach, uh, but they're not cracking just yet, okay? My point with gold and silver lately in the service, I've been talking a lot about this and Mark in a minute too, is that gold and silver rolled over, but they just haven't cracked just yet. So uh, silver looks a little bit better on the downside. I do occasionally buy um, physical silver, but not a lot. I, I'm kind of kind of breaking my uh, rule about there are no good longer term assets, but um, kind of I've always been a little bit of a silver bug and, and gold bug my life all my life. But silver looks like it's in trouble, so I'm not I'm definitely going to buy any silver for a while here. Okay. Yeah, if you had the short one, I short silver. I'm not a big fan. I'm not excited about short and silver, given the nature of of everything that's going on. Yeah, step I've been watching. And I'm having a hard time getting excited about it, but yeah, technically, if it closed at let's say 27, it would be a buy at B. So yeah, it's on my radar. I have it up on the other screen. Um, it can be a little thin, so watch your. I think that's one reason I talked myself out of it. The spread could be kind of wide. Yeah, two dollars over spot. I'd like to get uh, closer to spot, but yeah, that's that's actually a good deal. Two dollars over spot. But I think spots headed lower for now. Not that I would buy on the way down, but I'd like to see see what happens. Lung, I like. Okay. Um, it's like I'd like to see maybe one more day, but it it it, it looks pretty good. It's took to take it off. I guess that's a TKO. So it looks pretty good. Uh, maybe an entry above the high and then stop out below the low. The volume is looks like it can be a little light, so check the. Um, I do like it. I do like it. Check the spread on that. So good eye on that. I think if that's not in the Landry list, it was or will be soon. Oops, I just deleted one. Was it Intuitive? Yeah, Intuitive's kind of all over the place. This is a. This has been kind of a hard stock to trade. It tends to kind of jump around a lot and gaps and just kind of meander around, but I would leave it alone. There's no, there's no pattern there. Okay. David wants to talk about K. Okay. K. Yeah. I like frog Donald. It's just uh yeah, this looks like it's in trouble. Okay. Now, if you're going to short something short Kellogg, you know, or short some kind of big stodgy stock, but eh, it's just kind of, Longer term, it just kind of chops back and forth. It's kind of a electrocardiogram. I'd leave that alone. I mean, what's, what do you get make? Maybe 10 points max. Frog, I like, Donald. 
I was I actually went I actually went to the website and watched YouTube videos on them yesterday, trying to wrap my head around what the hell they do. That's probably best that I don't understand what they do. The only thing with this one is it's pretty super duper volatile. Okay, I do like it. Um, where's my card for today? <laughs> I think I'm a card today. It's, where is it? Let's see. Look at frog. <laughs> right there. Look at frog. <laughs> and I did. But yeah, I think it's a. Uh, I think it has potential. I think it's just gonna require a crazy, crazy, crazy stop. I'm trying to wrap my head around this one, but I like it a lot. Okay. But it's crazy. You, you, I like. You know what I would do? Uh, if I were you, Donald, your kids are probably a pain in the ass if they're any like anything like mine. I would take all their college funds. You know, they, they're probably not going to even get to college, right? And I would I'd mortgage your house and then uh, sell your wife's jewelry and I'd put everything into this one stock, okay? <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking. I'm going to get in trouble one night. It's going to be out of context or something. Yeah, it looks pretty good. It's trying to come out of this pullback, but I still think it has a ways to go. It was a setup for today. I think the entry was 90, a gap above that. I use a little stretch and I got in kind of late, okay? But it looks pretty good. I like it. I like it a lot, okay? About a 10 point, 10 points both ways on that. GovX is an IPO. See, I don't know if it's an IPO or not, okay? But yeah, it looks great. If it was a little bit higher in price, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have bought it on the close today. I've been buying a little gold and silver too. I'm putting a small percentage of my capital into it. Though, as you say, there are no good long-term investments. Yeah, and that's the thing. Expect every investment class, asset class, to lose at least half its value at some point in your lifetime. If you want to whip, wrap your head around that, that's okay. And you can live with that, that's okay. The other thing is it has to have some kind of in-use value, okay? So let's say in, in a... I use an example, and this this reasoning comes from Mike Moody, who gave a presentation on this. And I and I think he, I don't know if he used an example of toilet paper or not, but when I was explaining to somebody or doing a webinar or whatever, I used toilet paper as, as an example. And ironically, that this year would have been a great year for that. <laughs> but let's say toilet paper is 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 on sale for 50 cents a roll or whatever, you know, something ridiculous, 25 cents a roll. And you buy a thousand rolls of it because you think that's a good deal and you got a place to store it in the whole nine yards. Okay. Forget about all those details. And it has in use value. It has some value down the road. Stocks have no in use value. This frog or unity or whatever, it doesn't have some kind of value down the road. This thing can go to zero. Okay. But something like Toilet paper has in use value. Something like silver has in use value. They're using the crap out of silver in these electric cars. And I'm not trying to make an argument, okay? The market's going down right now, so I'm not buying, right? But it has in use value. It also has, I suppose, barter value in case the SHTF. I'm holding it for life so I can live with it. it was actually a lot younger than most of us. So I'm sure he can handle it. <laughs> good for you. Uh, you got a good head on your shoulder, Zach. I, I, you know, I wish I had a, a, your head on my head, your head. I wish I had your thought process when I was younger. Okay, so Geovox is, is a new, the consensus is Geovox, G, Geovox is an IPO. All right, we're gonna go with that. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I'm way over time, so I need to go ahead and wrap things up. I appreciate everybody being here. I really do. Sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so much. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment down below, like the video, hit the little notification bell, and I really appreciate it. I'll give you a high five. Everybody have a fantastic night, and I'll see you. I think everybody here, I'll see you guys tomorrow in Facebook. Thank you so much. You're welcome.